Okay, we got a big one today. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to be recreating another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at the art of Vincent van Gogh, or Vincent van Gogh, I think as it's more properly pronounced. <laughs> and we're going to be painting this self-portrait that he did in September 1889, about 10 months before he passed away. It is considered to be his final self-portrait, which is kind of odd because he looks probably more youthful than he than he did in almost any other of his self-portraits that he did. Uh, because he also did a whole bunch of other ones, about five other ones, right at this, right around this same time, within the, a, a few weeks of this one, as well as another. I think about 41 in total, 35, which are considered to be legit, another five or six are debated. So this is considered to be sort of at the, the end of a long uh, and very productive period of self-portrait painting. And so it's really kind of exciting to, to, to attempt this one here. Um, and this painting also, incidentally, is one of the most expensive paintings that has ever been sold or purchased. It was bought for $113 million in 1998, or it was, I think, $78 million in 1998. Prices and adjusted for inflation, $113 million, which is a lot of money. I'm curious, let me know in the, in the comments below what you would spend $113 million on. Would it be this painting if you could afford it? I don't know. I mean, I love this painting, which is one of the reasons why we're going to paint it. I don't know if this would be how I would spend my money, however, especially because we could just make our own version of it, right? So let's get right to that. So the painting we... To, to make this painting, here's the steps that we're going to proceed with. We're going to get the image on the canvas. We're going to put a little bit of color on there. While that's drawing, we're going to talk about Vincent van Gogh. More, more specifically, the last few months of his life. Uh, and then we're going to go through a few different steps as we make the painting. Kind of going back and forth between foreground and background. Our finishing touches probably in about two hours from now. In about two and a half hours we'll be uh, doing our side-by-side -side comparison. Which, you know, again, this painting, I'm not sure how long it would have taken him, but if we if we can, he painted pretty quickly, so we'll see, maybe we can, uh, we'll, 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 we're in a race with Van Gogh himself. So if you wanna support the channel, there's lots of different ways to do it. If you're brand new, like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. This Saturday, I'm doing an episode where people like you, if you upload your artwork to the private Facebook group that that our community has created, I will take a look and offer some feedback on it. That's one of the more popular things that we do around here, so you can certainly do that. Also, if you want to support the channel with a couple of dollars or a dollar, the price of a cup of coffee, here's a couple of fantastic ways that you can do it, and I'm certainly honored. There was a whole bunch of new donations over the past few days, so I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. So, let's get this painting onto the canvas. Now, the uh, the original is obviously, this is the painting, but I've also done an outline. So I traced it using the Procreate app on my iPad Pro. People are always asking me what I do. Uh, and I'm also using the same app to draw a comic book, which will be a big graphic novel, 180 pages, which will be out on stores about a year from now. Um, and so let's, I'll show you where you can download this file. So here is actually, here's the Facebook group I encourage you to join. Awesome group of fantastic artists. And if you click in the, the description below, you'll see a Dropbox link for the template. And you'll see that there's about 150 folders in here. And our most easy paintings are at the very top. We're slowly adding more and more as we go. But the, the, the more complex paintings are begin with numbers. And I still think most of these should be accessible for even a beginner painter, but some of them, you know, use a little bit more complex techniques. And if you want to get better, we're certainly, you have these ones to, to at least try it if you like. 
especially if you like what happens today. So if we click in this folder, you'll see these paintings in here. Now, if you're watching a few years from now, there's gonna be more, full, more images in this particular Van Gogh folder as we go, but just for today, this is what you'll see right now. <laughs> Because some people are like, oh, there's 12 files in here. What? He said there's only three. Things are going to change, right? So, uh, yeah. So if you, there's these three files. There's the original. And then there's two versions of the outline in JPEG and a PDF. Okay. So let's get uh, this painting onto the canvas. I'll show you how to, once you've downloaded it and printed the outline out, um, then I'm going to play this video and I'm just going to talk over top of it and explain what we're doing here. Should it wish? Okay, there we go. So I'm painting on a nine by 12 sized canvas board. I got mine from Amazon. You can buy them from the dollar store. Oh, let's try that again. <laughs> this one. Oh, let's do it again. Okay, so here's this nine by 12 size canvas board. Uh, I think they're they're better than the ones you can get at your dollar store, and they're only $2 instead of a dollar. I, I, I encourage you to spend just a little bit more money, although if you're just learning, there's nothing wrong with, with using cheap supplies. That way you don't feel like you're burning money if, if things aren't turning out the way you like. So I'm gonna use some of this carbon paper and I always want to use this the shiny side down and this carbon paper has been well used I've you can get away with 10 15 uh, tracings on the same sheet so now there's a lot of lines on here I'm not gonna go through every line um, some of the lines like in the hair and on the shirt I'm not gonna do all of them because some of them um, aren't oh, let's aren't required right because we're going to paint over this whole thing so you only need to to do the ones that um that you're gonna that, that we need really for the structure of the image so now that i've got this i can keep it and again if the painting doesn't turn out the way you want especially if you're just beginning then keep the, your template try it again try maybe try it again a few weeks from now or a couple months ago from now and then you can keep your original side by side and you can actually see your growth as an artist, which I think is a very satisfying experience. Okay. So let's, now that we've got the image onto the canvas, the next step that we want to do is called the imprimatura, which is the first layer of paint. And typically what artists do is paint a kind of a rusty red to get started, which is kind of your, your middle value between black and white, but it's got a little bit of color in it. And that's usually really desired when we're painting a portrait, because we can use that color as a foundational value layer in the portrait. Like some of that might actually show through all the way to the very final brush strokes. Or or it, it won't be covered up, it will be there, sorry. As the as a visible brushstroke all the way through. So what I do, however, is a little bit different, just because it speeds things up. We're not mixing a brown five minutes into the painting. I, I like to use this warm yellow. I put a little bit of water in here, which just is going to help make the paint a little bit thinner and dry much faster, more evenly and is less likely to obliterate all of the pencil lines that we just spent all that time tracing. So I'll stir this up. And then I'm gonna apply this over here. Now we'll take a look after I've done this just to see maybe what uh, he did at this initial stage. You, you could skip this step entirely and just paint directly onto a white canvas. That's no problem. Um, but you may at the very least want to consider using something like uh, a paint, a color 
that's called like unbleached titanium white. Unbleached titanium white sort of has an eggshell like color. And I used to use that color all the time in my painting as if as for this exact purpose, this imprimatura. Um, because I it kind of looks a little bit like raw canvas. And again, it's the the white of the canvas I always find just a little bit distracting. It always just seems if I ever see it kind of through the paint or between brush strokes, to me it always just looks like a painting is unfinished. So this just gives it a little bit more of a, um, I think, finished quality, professional quality. And you don't have, you could use any color. Like we could put, we which we have, we've used like a, a cool red, a magenta, that kind of thing on here. And um, so you could put green, you could put orange, you could put whatever. Uh, it's going to create maybe some, some strange color results afterwards because that color might mix in optically t with your final layers. But anyway, one thing I was just, uh, I've been trying to do more recently is just to show uh, some of the colors. This is the palette that I use for, this is painting, or episode 201. I would have done more paintings than that. Some episodes have two or three paintings. And I've used this exact palette for every single one of them. Really only seven colors. I do have black, but we rarely use black because we can mix our own black, which I think is if you're a beginner, knowing how to do that is essential. So if I refer to like a cool yellow, this is what I'm talking about. Now you don't have to use this brand. You could use Golden, which is a little bit more of a professional grade paint. You could use Liquitex. You could use Windsor & Newton. You could use Artist Loft, the Michaels Art Supply brand, the Buzz Paint, Peebo, Holbein, and Dyler Rowney. Those are the, your, your major brands. And you're gonna see some of these names repeat or they're very close, but that's the, that's the they're not always exactly the same. That's why I included this. Now you can go back and, and pause and rewind and take a screenshot, or you could just watch the, 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 the five episodes that I did teaching you how to paint and we cover this in depth. Okay, so while this is, actually, you know what? Let's just take a quick second, just to double check and see if we wanna do any more color on top of this yellow before we get started. What I'm looking for, I just wanna see if we can see any gaps between the paint and see if there's a color in here. Now, this image uh, that I'm using is not the best photo, best reproduction. It looks a little bit out of focus or misregistered. Um, so I can't really see anything. He's, he's, I mean, I don't, I wonder what this is, if that's an, an, a layer of paint that he's painted over top. So it's not clear. So I think what we've done here is more than fine. It's, it is, it's, I would say pr probable that he might have painted this on a, a white canvas or a canvas that, that was close to white. So that's just in interesting for me just to think about it. Anyway, I think we'll, we'll, we'll progress from this point here just to talking a little bit about the biography of Vincent van Gogh. And, you know, I've been doing a, a bunch of research as I always do for every one of these episodes. And van Gogh is, you know, ha has a special place in my heart. So I really like immersing myself in this. So we'll just sort of, as a quick review, because we've probably done about six or seven episodes on Van Gogh already. We've talked about his biography in depth, but maybe more of his, the, the earlier part of his life than, than the latter part. In fact, today's painting might be the one of the, one of the later paintings that I think we've ever done, now that I think about it. Uh, so which is why I, I kind of want to talk maybe a bit more about the last year or so of his life. So he's born in 1853 in Holland and dies in 1890 in France, in the south of France. Uh, he died at age 37, 
which is fantastically young for for anyone, let alone an artist. We've looked at a lot of artists who passed away in their 80s and 90s. And really, Van Gogh didn't really start devoting himself to, to painting in a, in a full-time serious mode until, what, he was maybe, I think, 32, 30, 31, around there. So it's really the last five or so years of his life where he is making he's he's painting now he had some experience uh before that when he was younger as you know almost every child plays with paint at some point maybe in school or at home but um after trying to become a priest and failing at that he sort of turned his attention to art and and uh so we're not gonna. There's this wiki art page has almost two thousand of his paintings. You know, Van Gogh is so well known that almost every single painting that he's ever made has has been photographed and uploaded to the web, which is which is not the case for almost ever. Most of the artists we've looked at. Sometimes we go to the wiki art page and there might be ten images or whatever here. But these are some of his most famous paintings. And just kind of as a quick little context for this. Uh, you know, we painted the Potato Eaters, which is probably his most famous early painting that he did. And certainly his probably most, for himself, his 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 first real masterpiece where he felt like he was at may, maybe achieving something, right? So that's 1885 by, when is it, uh, the fall of 1890, August? J July of, of 1890 is when he's dead. So that gives you a good five five years of of of, uh, of of doing it, making his art. So these are all you know his most famous starry night, the sunflowers, irises, which we're going to be painting over the next some at some point over the next few months, and then the painting considered to be his final painting, the wheat field with crows. So the, so let's. See. Um, I think what I wanted to show here, and this is the painting we're about to do, is just a quick selection of some of his other self-portraits and drawings, paintings that he did. Because I said, he's, Van Gogh ranks amongst one of the most uh, prolific self-portrait painters in art history. I mean, other artists that come to mind would be Rembrandt, Frida Kahlo, I suppose Van Gogh did a number of, of self-portraits, particularly towards the end of his life. But Van Gogh might be... Did I say Van Gogh or Picasso? I meant Picasso is also did a few. Van Gogh, um, uh, though, is, is I think maybe most particularly identified with the self-portrait, maybe more so than any of his other maybe still lifes and landscapes. Because I think what people see in these self-portraits is not just somebody who's practicing how to paint and using himself as a subject, but he sort of seems to be exploring his inner life, his psychology through his paintings, and they seem to sort of document, or at least people will tend to look at them as sort of documenting a person who is um, maybe struggling with mental health, and people look at them trying to see is, is in the way are those eyes, is that kind of... A sadness that he's commenting on on his internal anxieties. In fact, I, this this great book, uh, which uh, I've read most of over the past few months, about uh, Van Gogh by Taschen, the that's the publisher. You know, it's a nice big thick book here, and you know it's funny in this book, it's the way that uh, this author sort of talks about. Um, like, for instance, let's just see, he's talking about this particular self-portrait, uh, which I think, no, we're not going to be doing that one uh, in the future, but, you know, here's some of the, the painting on the facing page is both more confident and aggressive. It is a surly, almost rude and choleric face, as if the sitter has had enough of examining his features for signs of madness. There's deep creases by the nose and cheekbones. The eyebrows are thick and prominent. The corners of the mouth have turned down. It is the face of a man with no more time for friendliness. It's like, hmm. <laughs> then you look at the painting and you're like, uh, I, I don't 
don't know. Does that is that what you see in there? I, it, I mean, that's I always find that funny reading like historians, especially uh, who are you know maybe a hundred, two, three, four hundred years after an artist passed away, trying to examine the the psychology of an artist through their work because sometimes artists deliberately. Um, muddy the waters and, and sometimes make themselves look better or worse than, than they might be. So let's just continue here. I was going to show you in the book, but I think we've got probably better images on here to, to look at. Um, now, it is interesting because there are a lot of Van Gogh forgeries and fakes out there. So I just want you to think about that as we look through some of these and to consider that some of these... In fact, I would I would be willing to bet that probably out of this what forty images we're looking through, that probably about four or five of them are not actually by Van Gogh, which is kind of you know maybe and might be one of the most famous ones. Could also maybe not an original. And just because a painting is not that good, we have we have done this painting before too, so you can watch that episode. Um, just because it's not good doesn't mean it's a fake. In fact, it's entirely possible that some of, like, a painting like this, which I think is a little funny looking, that, that could, it could entirely be authentic. And then maybe a more well-executed one could be real, because if you were making a forgery, you'd probably, like, you kind of think, like, do I want to make it look like really really good so people just can't turn it down even if they have suspicions that it's a fake or do I want to make it look like it's not that good because then people are like oh well it's it's authentic but there's probably the reason why it didn't surface till now is that people didn't think it was all that good I mean you're sort of getting into these uh, these mind games here but one thing I want you to think about also while we look at, at these images is that almost every single one of them features him with a, a beard and a lot of them, he's got a pipe or he's got a hat on. He's got his, sh his short hair uh, and the, also the backgrounds as well. Because we could see that all of the backgrounds also use the same sort of approach to painting. Usually these short, quick brushstrokes that he also uses on his face and beard and clothing, etc. Um... You know, at the very least, I look at, at a lot of those paintings, and some of them are certainly much stronger than others. And some of them, you know, I like this this one. It looks a lot more like a Matisse painting. You know, I love that love this one too. That's great. And so we see here, so Van Gogh, I think it's. December 23rd, 1888 is when Van Gogh cuts his ear off. Um, and, in a, you know, probably one of the most famous incidents, moments in all of art history after an argument with his good friend Paul Gauguin. And we're going to do a couple Gauguin paintings coming up as well. And he cuts off his left ear, actually kind of slices the top part. So it's just the, the earlobe is hanging off. And from about this moment forward, most of his portraits, self-portraits, all feature the right ear because he's turning away. Now, it looks it's a little confusing because we have to remember that he's looking into a mirror, so everything is reversed. So when you're looking at this and, you know, you're like, oh, well, he's looking, you're saying this is your right ear. This is my right ear, but I'm my, the image is is being flipped digitally, right? So he's actually painting this ear and it's, anyway, you know what I mean, right? Um, so, uh, and so what we see here, the other thing too is in, so obviously anyone who's gonna commit that level of self-harm cut off their ear is going through some serious um, struggles and so he was kind of in and out of a asylum in the south of France for kind of in um, uh, the early part of 1889 
and he's sort of he's let out of the asylum for a period of time and then he sort of comes he volunteers to come back he uh, also you know stops painting for a short period of time he tries to eat some of his paints which is another, you know, there's a lot of people have various different uh, interpretations of why he did that. Some saying he did that because he was like trying to, uh, like it was very romantic, consume the paint that uh, in order to take its energy, you know, like a cannibal might by consuming its his or her enemy. Um, some say he was just in a fit of madness and just squeezed it like you might squeeze ketchup out of a bottle into your mouth. Uh, I don't... I've... I, you know, that's certainly... A, um, if it happened as described is is very strange behavior, for sure. Uh, it's also... I mean, I again, I, I, I'm not... I don't, I don't know entirely, but, you know, so often artists, even during this period, might lick their paintbrush to help get it kind of to a sharper point, just like I did. And sometimes artists would do this while they had paint on their brush and just spit the paint out kind of thing. Because, you know, you're talking 150 years ago where, you know, the, the our concept of what could be poisonous or, you know, certainly changed. Because oil paint was is made with linseed oil, which on its own is not necessarily poisonous. Um, so technically one might think it, it could be edible, right? I mean, I have a daughter and there's edible marker, not edible, but non-toxic paints and markers. You're not supposed to eat them, but you can. So, uh, at this time, uh, Van Gogh in September of 1889 goes through this sort of period where he does a bunch of portraits, not only of himself. And so here's this one. This one I think is, is right before... And, and claims to show his mutilated ear. And again, this, I don't know, that, like, it's possible that that's, because, you know, how, this to me, you know, I was doing some reading about how does this make any sense? If that's his left ear, technically, if he's looking in a mirror, the left ear is on the other side of the painting. So did he paint this picture painting his right ear, but then pretend to you know and from what I understand when he cut his ear off he actually cut the top of the ear and just left the earlobe so this one I don't know I, I I haven't read anything saying it's a forgery but it does seem strange to say the least right and, and there's portraits of other artists that made pa paintings of Van Gogh as well Toulouse Lautrec Gauguin and this is a portrait of his brother okay so let's um Let's get right. Let's let's move to the painting. We could talk about about his biography a little bit more as we go, um, because let's get painting here. Okay. So typically, what we do at this stage is we make an underpainting, and an underpainting has many different definitions. It could be where we just paint uh, lines, like some outlines for eyes, maybe lips and noses, collar. Some artists define an underpainting as, as, as putting some actual solid areas of color in here. With Van Gogh, let's take a look at the original and just think about how, if we were to do an underpainting, what we might do. Now, Van Gogh probably sketched this painting out directly onto the canvas. So without a pencil, just starting to paint with his brush. Because at this stage, he is, he's a master. He's been painting solidly at least one or two paintings every day for five years. So he is like cranking these things out. And, you know, when you get that good, you often don't have to do any kind of sketching. You can kind of visualize the image on the page and then you can kind of, you know, make it work as you're, as you're painting it. So... I think I will do a little bit of underpainting here just to get maybe some of our our major facial features in so that we don't lose them as we begin. So let's put some paint on the palette and 
Uh, let's start mixing here. Again, I, I, I mentioned what these colors are and, and alternative paints that you could use if you don't want to use this brand, which you don't have to because I'm not sponsored by them, so it doesn't offend me in the least. Um, oh, that's a lot of blue. One thing with this painting, maybe I'll just put it back on, on the screen while I'm doing this, is he is using warm and cool colors in a very traditional way, in the way that we've talked about um, over and over and over again. He's got this kind of a teal background, which is a cool blue and cool yellow. He's got warm blue in the shirt. And then the face has got warm browns. And all of that is done to help push that face forward spatially in this composition. Okay, and cool yellow, and we're all done. In fact, you know, it's weird. Looking at this image that I've got here, the one in the book looks a little bit better. And I think if we just look at that, I think we'll see that uh, yeah, and interesting, isn't this? Maybe I should have. Wow, it's a much better quality image. Let's just show these side by side. I might even replace these after this episode. So that we, um, because it, you could see this one's just a much higher quality image, like down in these areas, and you could see the blue that's all missing. It wouldn't surprise me actually if the the image there on the left was was a um, per, but was done before it was cleaned to see so much more blue up here, cool blue, and then to see these warm blues down here, that's very interesting. I mean, this is what happens when you see images on the web and we pull them off, they're not always... But then, who's to say that this image in the book is more accurate than, than that one? I, I mean, I'm just gonna keep this open here to the side so that I can um, refer to it, because I think I like there's a little bit more subtlety in that background that I want to bring out. Okay. So let's, I'm going to mix a dark color that we can use for our outlines. And as usual, probably just going to mix my uh, warm red and cool yellow together. Sorry, warm red and cool blue. We mix these together and we're going to get a very dark kind of purpley brown because these two colors are virtually opposite from one another on the color wheel. So, and I might, I might just paint with this color. Let me think about it. You know what, what I'm gonna, I'll do is I'm gonna take some of this cool yellow, make this, turn this into a a black basically and then I'm gonna mix a warm brown actually you know what that's this is kind of brownish because what what I have here is I have warm red and cool yellow together and that's what makes an orange and put a little bit of blue in and so it's gone brown if I want this to be more black I would add I need to add more blue into it to compensate, to pull this brown further towards the center. So, you know, what I was thinking about doing was mixing a, a bit of an orange and then adding this to it to get a little bit more of a brownish, um, uh, warm brown color. But I think this is gonna work just fine because I don't have quite as much blue in there. But anyway, we're gonna paint over most of it anyway. So I just wanted to explain, you know, my my thinking here, let me see. Let's go to something just a little bit smaller. So, 
so the, the really what I want to do is just to preserve uh, some of the the facial features in here like the eyes the nose shape so that as I start building up more and more layers of paint I don't lose these details now I've done I've been painting for about 30 years now so I'm not personally too worried about losing these details but I know that one of the most common things that I hear in the chat on the Facebook group etc is that people you know get really stressed out if they lose the the these guidelines the pencil lines so if if that describes you then this is probably a kind of a necessary step to help um, alleviate a little bit of anxiety at this stage of the painting. Let's put them side by side here. neck here and I think that's probably enough to get started conceivably we could also do this with uh, his shirt so maybe I will do that so the shirt what we've got is this kind of warmish blue so let's just take a bit of this I'm gonna put it right here little bit of outlining you know this, again some of these lines might just stay here throughout the entire painting and we don't ha even have to go over them at the end Don't worry about making doing thick brush strokes or anything or making often one of the things when I'm making these paintings I sometimes uh, think about applying the paint kind of thin because I don't want to have ridges and too much texture because I can pa make painting over top of it kind of tricky Van Gogh is sort of one of the great exceptions to that rule where having a little bit of texture is desired uh, it's it's kind of a, a an iconic part of his work and his style so I don't think you can uh, you can almost like not go too far in that respect okay I think that's enough for me anyway of an underpainting you know if it was Van Gogh he, he probably would have done maybe a little bit more outlined his face and his hair um, in fact well, 
yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it like that. I was going to maybe do the outline, do a little bit, sort of replicating what he did. But, it, but we have the advantage of knowing what the final painting looks like, so we can kind of skip a, a little bit. Van Gogh didn't know what the painting was going to look like before he began, and he's painting it and sort of it's coming together as he's working. So what he would have done would have done a little bit more of the features here so that he knows where the outside edge of his head is. We're just going to launch right in and paint that. Okay. So let's go to the next step here. So now that we've got a little bit of some outlining done or underpainting accomplished, let's now start putting some paint, I think, into the background first. So with this painting, um, our background, you know, as I said, it, it, it looks kind of different depending on, on which book or Im image we're referring to I'm gonna come back to this one because I, I I like this more and especially in the background a lot of the rest of the painting not so many differences maybe there's you know it seems like it's almost a little bit more warm blue got a little bit of this green down here which we don't see in this one but I want to bring some of this cool blue back out that I don't see in my image. So I think that's gonna be probably my foundational layer. And then this kind of bit muddier green is something we'll put on afterwards. So let's bring this back. You know, maybe even put this, oops. some colors right next to it. Okay. So this color is is basically going to be our cool um, our cool blue and I was going to make it with a big brush but the way that he's painted, and you know, it's very typical with Van Gogh, is lots of tiny little brush strokes. So I'm actually gonna take this cool blue, I'm gonna mix it right over here. And I'm gonna take some of this cool yellow and bring it into the color. Not very much of it, because if we put a lot of that in here, then we're gonna get a teal. I don't want it to be quite so... Um, see how minty that looks actually that's pretty good but I'm just gonna put a little bit more blue in here I think that's that's pretty close and the other thing with Van Gogh is he would he would paint um, sometimes mix colors directly onto the canvas so I'm going to allow this color to, um, I'm going to allow it to, to kind of change as I'm painting it. And, um, so that I have uh, a background that is, is pretty developed. In fact, let's, I don't usually do this, but I'm just going to take do this again side by side here. I'm going to take my paint and I'm going to kind of basically fill up different colors to kind of come in.
And, you know, by the end here, probably most of this is just going to get covered up with this blue. So it might be... Um, but I don't mind if it gets... If a little bit of this yellow comes through. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this same paint. I'm going to add a... Uh, maybe that's a little bit too much yellow. A little bit more of that blue. You can see there was some of that warm red from before. Let me take a bit of my dark color and mix this. there's it also kind of looks like there's a bit of I don't, I don't think you can really see it here but there's a bit of like warm orangey color in here so I'm gonna take some of my warm um, uh, warm green and now I'm just gonna paint with this even right into this wet blue paint. And now I'm going to slow down a little bit. I was going pretty fast there. And again, you can see that like, I'm not, I, I don't care about the paint being all one solid, perfect mixture. I'll let it kind of, as it gets on the canvas, kind of mix a bit. So let's, I'll just show you side by side, which what I was up to here. So this is we're gonna darken that down even more later on, and I might come back with my blue and actually brighten a bit more up. But I think just for right now, that is a pretty satisfying kind of beginning.
clean some of these brushes off. Look at this. We got Eleanor, Eileen, John, Carlito, Sandra, Pascal. Lots of familiar faces in the chat. Carlito says, yo, Markowski, I have a question about art and stuff. Will you ever take on or at least try a day on conserving slash art restoration? Interesting question. I um, I don't think anyone's ever asked that before. Um, uh, I guess like in, in what, what would be the, would it be about how to, preserve or restore or conserve existing artworks um, because if you had a painting of yours like an old painting that's been in your family for a long time and you're thinking about painting on top of it <laughs> that makes me a little bit nervous um, there, there's people that go to to school for master's degrees in art conservation, so it's you know you know who really study how best to use it because ideally you want to try to use the same sort of process, pigments, techniques, materials, so that not only the colors match and maybe you don't even see that it was it was fixed or touched up. Um, but also so that it doesn't damage the painting in any way, right? And that's really the main focus of like a cure of a um, someone who restores or conserves art is to try to do to try to stop the any further degradation in the painting, and then to try to not do anything more that might worsen the present condition, <laughs> which which sounds kind of like well, obviously, but. You know, there every once in a while you see in the news, um, people like uh, there'll be a, a petition signed by 150 conservators around the world who say that what they're doing to such and such famous painting is destroying it, and they're stripping off the original paint, and it's you're rendering it val valueless. So it's um. It's an interesting question. I, I don't know. Like I I would be I, I probably would not touch if I if I let's say had a Van Gogh or, or even a painting by a, a much lesser known artist, I I would be very reluctant to start painting on it or doing any sort of home restoration on a painting. For for all sorts of reasons. One is that that you know, the famous example of the um, Eke Mono painting, remember the we, which we did for April Fools last year, of the Jesus that was restored by the women in Spain, and it ended up looking like this, you know. <laughs> again, we we did that painting. It was pretty funny, but you know, it's a it's a very famously poorly restored painting that ultimately destroyed it and transformed it. Now it's obviously taken on a life of its own and, and more tourists have come to that that church to see it than ever before but uh, yeah I would take it to somebody who's, whose job it is to do that that would be my, my response but an interesting question for sure for sure um, oh and there's Donna who's just watching um, not, not, not feeling well I hope you forget you feel better Donna Okay, so let's do our next step here. Now that we've got the background painted, let's start painting the face in the clothes, right? That's our foreground in this particular image. So we're going to start putting in a little bit of color. And when once we sort of got sort of the basic, you know, major shapes in here, then we'll go back to the background, we'll finish that background, and then we will come back and finish the foreground. So, I think what we should do is mix a warm brown, and we can use that for the hair, as well as some of the more shadowy areas of the face. Then we'll start putting a little bit of white and yellow into it, and do some of the lighter areas, and then we'll leave it like that, and then we'll, we'll do the, the clothing. 
so let's see these side by side so what i want to do is i'm going to take my my warm red and my cool yellow and i don't mind if there's a little bit of this green in fact i'm just going to take it in here because we're, this will be sort of a foundational layer here, so if it gets kind of consumed, let's just mix this up. At this, if you if you want to make a darker brown, the more red you put in there, the better. Um, because then we're going to balance it out with some warm blue. And the more blue and red you have in your brown, the darker it's going to be. I mean, when we, we will make a different version of this brown that has mostly that warm yellow, and it'll be much lighter. It'll be almost like a orange brown rather than this dark, dark brown. Okay. And I think we'll, we'll start with this, and then we'll even add a little bit of our darker color into it as well. I'm going to go down to a smaller brush. And again, I want to try to capture some of the, the, the speed at which he's painting. It wouldn't surprise me if he was doing something like this to get started just sort of a bunch of pretty aggressive colors loading the surface up I think that's probably what he would have done to kind of get started. Now I'm going to take this same color. I'm going to mix a little bit of this darker brown in here. Or this almost or basically our black, right? The color that we used to do the outlining, the underpainting. And then we could just sort of come back around and just darken a few more things in this same sort of area.
that okay so now how do I want to do if we look at this ah. is to get our lighter skin value probably I'll go to this complete opposite here so I'm gonna take this color some white again I don't really care if there's a little bit of paint on there and I don't think Van Gogh would have either because what's nice about that is it also just gives a slightly weirder more nuanced kind of color now let's take a bit of this brown I think that's pretty good for at least right now bit of this in the hair and notice I, I start picking up a little bit of paint as I'm painting in this in the hair or uh, sorry I'm picking up a little bit of the darker paint as I'm doing this that's okay too Then I'm going to take the same color, but I'm going to take a bit of this warm red and just mix a little bit of that, maybe a bit more. Just a bit of this orangey color.
<laughs> and Donna says, my hair looks like his, all sticky uppy since I got my halo off. Oh, I was, okay. I thought you meant, like, actual halo for... Uh, my apology, Don. I forgot you were in that uh, the accident, or and uh, <laughs> I just was thinking about our Zelensky painting. I think you probably do also have a real halo, Donna. I think um, you're a lovely person, so you merit a halo. <laughs> beyond the, the halo from the hospital. Uh, Sandra says, I love to use books as reference for our master studies if I can be lucky to find them. It's Yeah, it's true. Some, sometimes there's lots of books on some artists. Sometimes you really have to dig to find them, don't you? Um, although, I don't know if it's still open, Sandra, but there's an awesome art book store down in Santa Monica on the uh, was it the Promenade? I mean, it's, some of those books are really expensive um, but but uh, I mean, if you're really having a hard you want to buy a book, you can't find it at a library you should be able to, I don't know what that bookstore is called that was always a dangerous place for me to go into because you could end up spending lots of money on on very few books, but you'd get the one that you wanted for sure um, okay, let's do the shirt down here. So we're going to put a uh, bit of a light blue, a uh, warm blue. And again, I'm just going to take this paint. I don't care if it's got other paint on it. Usually I would be a little bit more leery about taking any other color. It's got other colors in here, but with Van Gogh, I feel like I feel much more uh, confident and more playful than I might otherwise be. So let's take that. And this is our much lighter blue. Even though there's going to be some darker blues here, I'm going to go right over top of this. That way it's going to give... Um, I can paint my darker blue over and it'll still be nice and vibrantly bright. In fact, I'm going to do this with a lot. I'm going to leave some of this yellow here, which I think will ultimately get covered up anyway. But I think it'll give at least a little bit more nuance to the painting. You know, again, I could just use a big brush like this and in 10 seconds be totally done. But there is something to be said about trying to use his sort of method and sort of just getting into this habit of doing these small brush strokes. So when we get closer to being done, we've sort of been practicing that sort of technique and we can just we're not trying that technique for the very first time on the final layers the finishing touches of our painting we've been experimenting with it and if we're not happy with it here well it's like everything just gets covered that's okay so I think you should really think of like the initial layers of paint you know, your first pass, as I like to call it, um, of a color or area 
as an opportunity to, to kind of play with technique and um, I think that's it can be a really fun fun part of the painting like I mean personally my favorite parts of making a painting are this stage and then the very very final stage I love this stage because it's there's a lot more freedom of just sort of painting not I can I'm sort of looking at the original but really just sort of glancing at it thinking okay it doesn't really matter too much exactly if I get everything in the right place it's more just getting some color down and then there's sort of that mid part of the painting for me can be kind of a tedious aspect because then we have to kind of obey the rules a little bit more and kind of if, assuming we're trying to recreate someone else's painting and then at the very end I like that part as well because there's more I, I feel like more freedom again because now I've sort of got everything kind of where I want I can really try to hue as close as possible to the original but it also prevent presents the possibility where I can kind of um, add my own little touches to it my own little bit of personality so uh, I'm gonna get this shirt in here I'm gonna take a little bit more white I'm just get a bit of that blue on there because I don't think I want it to be totally white Might be the only place where there's pure white like this so let's also i think those eyes those eyes are pretty close to this blue and a kind of almost a bit of yellow that we had there before a bit of a teal thing You know, it looks funny now that I put that paint there with the eyes, but again, it's it's always it's easy it's easy for me to say, but if you're a beginner painter, it's really hard to just leave that like that. You're just like, well, it looks awful. You just have to be like, okay, yeah, but it's not done, right? It's okay if it looks awful right now because why should it look anything other than you know you, you know that's why they don't let people into the car factory while they're assembling your car because you'd be like what it's missing the doors and the wheels what kind of car and they're like buddy there's still a bunch of steps on the assembly line this is why we don't let people onto the manufacturing floor because we get these stupid questions so you just have to remember okay this is just part of the process we're just gonna l let it stay like that i kind of was thick with the paint so i'm just gonna leave it and let it dry okay um, so next let's go back into the background let's let's just finish the background and then we're gonna go back to the foreground finish the foreground and we'll be all done so in terms of finishing this background if we look at them side by side here obviously this is the colors are, are much brighter I'm, I'm gonna go in and kind of darken them down a little bit but I do want to um, just slide this over and again look at this other painting because the colors are a little bit different um, I think I'm gonna put a little bit I wonder which direction we should go I think I, what I want to do is darken 
and then maybe put the blue back into certain places. So I'm gonna mix this color, which I think, you know, I bet you what he did, now that I'm, the more I look at this, I bet you he, he actually finished the face. I bet you he had this cool blue everywhere in the background and was not happy with that result. So he probably just took the, his paint that he was using for his foreground layer and just started painting directly into this cool blue. And this is oil paint, so it would have just started mixing anyway. Because these are, are, the more I see, these are just a lot of cooler, or sorry, warmer c colors that are, he's sort of muddying this, this area. Now when we look at them side by side, it's not as clear in this image. Um, so I want to go, I think, a little closer to this one here. So that means that means that I'm gonna I want to do a bit more of a warmer green. So I'm gonna take some of my cool, or sorry, my warm blue, and this is my warm yellow that I had here before. And that's gonna give me this bit more of a grassy green, less of a, a bright lemony color. I'm gonna even take a bit more of it. And I think that's pretty good, actually. So we're gonna paint, mm, might be a little bright. So let's take a bit more yeah, uh, blue. how that brown got caught in my on my brush there. Okay, I'm gonna take more more blue. So much brighter on camera than, than this. That's okay. Um, let me put a bit of white in here. see that white really kind of got rid of some of the very luminous paints that we that I was you know that green that was really bright also again I'm painting quickly you know and with acrylic paint it's sort of required because unless I put a bunch of slow dry medium in here um, it's the only way I'm going to kind of get those colors to be mixing on the canvas as they are Let's just see these two side by side. I think I could still go even kind of deeper.
These brush strokes are a bit more on an angle here. And then, you know, if you feel like you've gone too far, just pick up a little bit more of the color that was there. Okay. And then I'm going to do take this blue that I had there originally. I'm just going to come back into here. I'm not worried about going over the top of this hair because I'm going to be painting hair back over in that area. There's just a few. Again, it's seeing them side by side on the screen there is, it's, I'm, it's, this is not ideal trying to do, you know, I, I really, what you should do is just sort of pick one image and paint to it rather than be um, doing what I'm doing, which is sort of flip flopping a little bit back and forth between two different images, because then I'm never, I'm not going to get either one right but I do like this one so I'm just kind of trying to get a little bit of that in there it's gonna mean that by the time this painting's done when we show the the one that's currently in the Dropbox which I'm gonna put I'll put two of them I'll scan this one from the book put it up there and then you're welcome to choose whichever one you want to use but obviously during the middle of the broadcast like that it's <laughs> Donna lost the halo said I'm a little devilish again <laughs> John says beautiful painting Michael looks really realistic awesome I appreciate that John and Pascal says little survey who's attempting the painting tonight I'm, cur I'm curious myself Pascal that's a good question thank you for asking that um, okay I'm, I'm happy with the background like this. I mean, again, we don't know until we're totally, you know, we've got our the foreground again with more paint on it. If it is indeed done, I could see darkening a little bit here. 
but I think for for my purpose I'm ready to move on again so the next step is we're gonna now try to bring the face and the, the clothing to a resolution and then we'll see if there's any finishing touches we need to do so let's take a look and maybe even side by side here I think now actually you know what just before I, I go I'm gonna take a little bit of this lighter paint and just shape his head in a little bit it looks like there was a little bit of that there and even just a little bit now he might have done this after having done the, the face just to give it just to clean that outline up a little bit it's not uh, unusual for artists to do that But I'm gonna just do that right now as a bit of a time-saving thing because I can always expand things at this stage and it'll just make it cleaner and save me some time if I don't have to do that later on because I've done it now. <laughs> Eileen says, Hi Pascal, I'm actually watercoloring an impressionist style field of flowers, focusing on watercolors for 100 days, but I enjoy this in the background. Wow, 100 days of watercolors, that's exciting. What a great challenge for yourself. I mean, by after 100 days, you'll probably know that medium much, much better, right? That's not quite a 10,000 hours, like Malcolm Gladwell says, but uh, that's, that's far more than most people invest in, in uh, learning anything, really. So let's... Where should we begin next? Now, so again, this is the stage of the painting. Remember I said where is maybe my less favorite. This is just personally, and I don't want to taint anybody else's feelings. But it's because now I have to start looking a little bit closer if I want to replicate or try to get some of the feeling and likeness of the original. So now I have to try to kind of mix colors a little bit more accurately and paint brush strokes a little bit more accurately, which is why maybe not my favorite part of the painting. I like what we've been doing so far where we can really play. Um, I think what I might do now is actually actually lighten because what okay so what I'm looking at is let's I'll just show you just so I can as I'm trying to figure things out in real time here because we've got everything in place I think some of the darker brush strokes or some of the final except a few like really really bright highlights those might be at the very very end but it kind of looks to me like he builds up some of the lighter stuff and then I mean I think what uh, sorry I think what he he does is sort of painting in a similar sort of method to me in that he starts kind of closer to the middle in terms of value and then starts going further further outward towards white and black so he gets sort of his mid-range values and then just keeps on going outward like this. So whether you want to go outward for a while with the lighter values or a little bit darker values is up to you. Um, I think though that I'm gonna go for some of the lighter ones next. Let's just do that. Um, okay. Let's 
so this was my lighter color that I had previously. I think we'll just take a bit more white. I need more warm yellow. Eileen's on day 25 of 100 days of, of watercolors. That's impressive. Wow. So actually, I'm going to take this color before I do anything else. I want to paint in, there's some orange, you know, you could see in the eyebrows and the hair. I'm going to do that right now. doesn't look very orange at the moment because it's just sort of isolated all by itself. When we start getting more contrasting colors on top of it, those colors will get brighter, will appear brighter. They don't actually get brighter, they just, by altering the colors around them, they get the appearance of brightening. I'm just going to continue. Let's, in fact, I'm just going to do this right up here. So this is a lighter color. And I'm going to, again, I want to try to now start painting a little bit more slow. In fact, let's zoom in. Focus on his forehead here. Maybe am I totally done here with the forehead? I might go even lighter here, but let's just keep on moving here with these kind of bigger, bolder brush strokes. That's starting to kind of get a little bit too light for some of those areas. So let's put a bit more warm yellow back into this paint.
Okay, let's look at the hair. And I, th and I also think Van Gogh also slows down at this time. Like the, the paint brushes strokes themselves stay quite vigorous, but I think he, the, he's not painting at the same speed. Like he's, he might um, uh, kind of think for a little bit before he puts a brush stroke down in a way that he might not have done earlier in the painting. Take a look. Got some of those. Okay, so let's go the opposite direction. Now we've been painting some of our lighter values. Let's now put some of the darker values in here. So some of them, which are much darker. So I think we can go to, in fact, and I might even Shift down to a bit smaller brush too. So this is a color that I used previously, but now, but I, before I would, you know, I use this for a lot of the stuff in the hair, but I was just sort of throwing color around and not really being too careful as to how I was putting it in here. Now I might want to think about being just a little bit slower. Again, let's zoom in a bit. What's interesting is that Van Gogh gave this painting to his mother, and uh, he. This is the, also the one where he shaved his beard, right? And, um, you know, back a hundred, some fifty years ago, it was quite common for men to have beards, uh, and yet I think he shaved his face because there was also remember. Van Gogh's now, Vincent has been in and out of asylums, and mental health has been a concern. His brother is very w much aware of him cutting his ear off because Paul Gauguin told him Paul Gauguin returned to Paris 
and went and talked to Teo, Vincent's brother. So the word was in the family that Van Gogh's having some serious difficulties. So I think part of him shaving his beard and sort of taking on this appearance is trying to kind of probably reassure the family that everything is all right. I've had this little bit of a, a lapse and, and you know, kind of uh, made, did some decisions, made some decisions that I'm not proud of, but everything's okay now. So you can see that just that little bit of blue that we put back in around the edge there. It just sort of helps pop, separate that, that face a little bit from the background. few of these marks, darker browns, I think, into the eyebrows as well. So this, okay, that's, I feel pretty good about that beginning on the face there. Um, I'm going to just lighten this up a little bit, or just go back to this brown, with, because basically to get the color I've just been painting with, right, this is closer to our outlining color. What I had done is mixed a warm brown using a warm yellow and warm red and warm blue. I'd mix those together here and I just used some of my dark color, basically a black, to get the color I was just painting with. So I'm just gonna go for just something a little bit lighter. And if anything, if I want, I can always just take a little bit more warm yellow, put that on my brush to get even lighter.
Actually, well, maybe before I go to the hair, let's maybe just look at the back, like ear and neck, etc. Here. Let's zoom out a bit so we can look at the hair. Okay. So we're just going to keep on doing the same thing with this little bit lighter color. It's, it's worth it's worth remembering again one of the the things that van gogh was reading about was the impressionists he was he's van gogh's considered a post impressionist even though he was friends or acquaintances with a lot of the impressionist painters probably most famous paul signac um who came and visited uh uh van gogh as, as soon as he had heard that Van Gogh cut his ear off, he was really the first person that came uh, to, to check on him. And part of the big thing with the Impressionists is putting not only different colors, but different values side by side to create contrast, right? So we really want to think about like putting darker colors next to lighter colors, almost like a checkerboard that you've got um, oppositions kind of happening constantly all the time you're trying to avoid putting two like brush strokes next to one another you're always trying to separate them with something that's a little bit darker a little bit I mean you can have some that you know these two are similar values this sort of pink peachy color and yellow that's fine but there's there's still different colors right so it's d color or value side by side that are contrasting
So I'm going to be putting other lighter colors and darker colors into these areas. And some, in some cases, painting over these lines that I'm putting in right now with lighter or darker ones, just depending on what's required. do is get a bit more of this warm red into this brown. Looks like there's a bit of magenta even coming into some of this up here. So I might just take a bit of this magenta, my cool red, and just take some of this brown and mix that in here, just as an alternative to the warm red. We haven't used any magenta in this painting at all. some of this kind of more magenta brown oops it's coming out the back of the hair there and while I'm here I'm gonna take a bit of white with this magenta and paint this and that eye there Kind of exaggerated it a little bit. That's I'm, I kind of went a little far, but that's okay. If I don't like it, I can always just paint over it. in with some of my even darker color. I 
Okay, so let's just take a look. We've been painting for a bit here. How they measure up side by side. And just take a sip of tea. Okay. I think we're, I'm coming along pretty well. And maybe, you know, that little bit of magenta might have been a bit much. Certainly his was much more subtle than what I just did. Um, I'm going to just leave it, though. I want to do some more, some darker stuff in the, in the hair now. Basically, I'm just going to take my darkest color to do some outlining, right? This is the same color that we used at the very, very beginning when we were doing our underpainting. So now I'm just going to take this and uh, do some outlining around these shapes here. I'll probably do more of this uh, in our finishing touches, which will happen probably in about 20 minutes from now. But it feels kind of satisfying doing a little bit of outlining. Outlining always helps. Um, shore up a painting and I, I mean I had instructors who told me that this was the lazy it's sort of like narration in a movie it's the lazy storytellers device or painters devices to outline things um, <laughs> and then hey if it was good enough for Van Gogh I mean it's kind of hard to argue that it's it, it doesn't you can't do it, right? Um, you know, I, I, you know. As I think I've mentioned before, I had a teacher who was adamant that like you should not do outlines at all in a painting. Everything should be subtle gradations. And I totally get it. I, at least in art school, I think it, it's helpful to learn those techniques. But if you don't want to use them, you don't have to. I think that's also important to understand that every artist sort of cobbles together their own sort of style and system. I want to come back to this eye. I just took my this kind of dark blue, or sorry, light blue, and just added a little bit of darkness. I also wanted to open that eyelid up a little bit more because I had painted it a little closed earlier. Okay, I feel better about that. Do I want to do those eyes? Maybe I'll save that to my finishing touch.
So I might just leave the face just like that then. Let's you can see them side by side. John's signing off says good night. Looks great. Bye guys. Eileen says, I attended a workshop recently with a prof from Massachusetts College of Art who has painted six by six acrylic paintings every day for almost seven years. That's super inspiring. That is awesome. <laughs> that is, that's inspiring to me. And I wasn't even in that class. That's great. Seven years daily on tiny ones. It's not always easy, says Pascal. Uh, like now, this Vincent is getting into detail that are difficult at this ratio of brush size to canvas. Be easier to paint this right profile, probably. Uh, you know, I, I keep forgetting. I wanted to I usually try to mention. So this painting is um, uh, 26 inches by 21 inches. So basically sort of double the size of this painting. A little bit bigger, uh, in fact, but uh, um, so you could you could easily stack two, maybe two and a half, two and a little bit of these paintings on top of one another to get to the actual size of this painting. Um, but uh, you know, yes, there are these tiny little brush. I mean, they're not that small. Like I think we can kind of get away with a lot of the stuff with our brushes here. This is obviously the bigger the canvas you're painting on, everything looks better when it gets reduced. Um, I do think if you've never painted on a much larger canvas before, uh, it's it's a, like a whole new ball game. It is it is trickier to paint a larger surface. hand stamping around on the as I'm painting I'll make it a mini mess okay so let's do the clothing and then we'll do our finishing touches so down here we've got the blue that's in everywhere here, but now we need to just add blue that's, we're gonna do kind of basically just darken everything down. So I'll take, this is my, my ultramarine blue. This is the color that I was painting with. So now let's just get darker. Not, not super dark, but darker than what we had previously.
and this you know you could see that the brush is a, is a bit of a dry brush too like we're not lathering on big thick parts big things of paint really anymore are going to be lighter. I'm just going to paint it like this and then I can always lighten these types of brush strokes over. Painting over them, painting things next to them. I just want to build up um, kind of a, a what would you call it? like a certain amount of this here that we can play off of Now I'm just going to go darker. I'm going to take, this is uh, some of my cool blue, I think. Oh no, this is, I don't know, sure what it is. I'm just going to take my darker color and mix it right into here. It doesn't, you could use black if you wanted. Oh yeah, so that, that I remember, that was, the, that was the color I made to do my outlines, and that was a warm blue with this dark color in there. I can put like some lines in between the darker line that or the this kind of lighter blue I can put lines in between that one sort of painting over my lighter lines and everything just kind of gets a bit darker
So I wonder what this outfit is. Is this something that was like he was wearing in the asylum? Like the clothes that were issued to him or I don't know. I've, it's in, he did do a few portraits of some of the other people in the asylum, but they're kind of unfinished and certainly not very well known. I, I can show you in the book maybe. Um, oops, what uh, just happened? Oops. <laughs> a little bit brighter for a few minutes so let's actually So there is a bit of this green down here that I think we should get a bit of. I mean, I like how that looks at the moment. But let's take uh, our warm yellow, and I'm just gonna mix it right into this color I've just been painting with. And it's gonna just get kind of, uh, kind of dark and kind of muddy, warm green. And then we can paint that. I guess it could be a little bit lighter, but maybe I'll paint these darker ones and then we'll just add a bit more yellow back in here. So now I'm just taking more yellow and just putting it more of this on my brush to lighten that color up. And let's take a bit of white and put this. I'm gonna kind of make it go a bit gray. I might have gone just a bit too light. a little bit with this green, light green color.
Okay. So, I think we're at the stage now where we can just start putting finishing touches on this painting. I don't, I mean, there's not really that much more to do except maybe a little bit of outlining around the eyes. I'm, I'm really happy, particularly with the clothing. I think that, that turned out really well. Um, although that's probably the most simple part of the painting, right? So, um, because really we can kind of just play with some of the lines that we have here. Uh, the the face and the background, the background's probably the most subtle, so that might give some people the, a lot of difficulty. Um, I just want to add... Okay. So let's go right into the eyes. I think I need to make more of my dark color, which is fine because I've got all this extra paint. Let's use it up. And it's also going to be nice and fresh, so I can kind of uh, it'll make it easier to paint our final layers a bit of paint with. Right, so that was just our cool blue, warm red, and cool yellow here. And now we've got a black, very close to a black anyway. And... Carlito says, did Van Gogh use any medium in his paintings? It looks like he used modeling paste for some of his brushwork, but that's just me. I mean, great observation, Carlito. Absolutely. Um, so Van Gogh was painting with oil paint, right? We're painting with acrylic paint. So um, in terms of oil paint, uh, mediums... I, you know, I've never really thought about is is there mediums for oil paint? Um, that's a <laughs> that makes me really think. I've never really thought about that before. Typically, you know what? It's a lot easier to get texture in your oil paint. Like oil paint is such a different substance uh, than acrylic paint. It kind of its texture is is has more volume and when it dries because it's there's no water in it it holds its texture pretty like so for instance acrylic paint is we have medium right plus pigment and the medium is probably i don't know maybe 60 percent water so when that water evaporates the whole thing kind of shrinks down a little bit because all that water is leaving the the body of the paint so it's it's going to shrink we can put molding paste like you said into that to help it keep the texture keep the the the, the volume on the other hand oil paint because there's no water in it it's just it's just curing it just needs to dry and so it, it might shrink a little bit and that's what happens when paint cracks is you might have a paint surface on the top that dries before the stuff underneath it dries and then as the stuff underneath it dries it might expand or contract causing that top surface to crack um, but it, it holds its volume much easier and longer than acrylic paint does without any medium really necessary um, so yeah I think that would be my answer to that I think I can't um, interesting question So like when we're painting with acrylic paint to get the texture and the volume that he has, we would have to use, like you said, a modeling paste or wax or some kind of substance in there to, to so that when the water evaporates, it doesn't just self-level. Okay. 
<laughs> Our daughter just woke up from her nap and is not happy. Okay, so let's tackle these. In fact, let's let's go in even closer. Because that's where we're going to be spending the next little bit. You know, it does make me... I, I was just thinking a little bit more about mediums when it comes to paint. You know, it, it's not unheard of for artists to, to add things into the paint. Like Jackson Pollock put sand, for instance, in his paint. Um, artists will sort of... <laughs> All the kind of things that just drive curate, like conservators, to go back to what we were talking about a little while ago, just absolutely bonkers because it can really um, jeopardize the 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 surface. I'm just taking some color, just left over some kind of greenish blue, painting that a little bit into those eyes. far with the darkening. I'm going to take a bit of my cool white or cool yellow and a bit of white. pretty happy with the way that looks um, oh the lips I think that needs some attention too so he's kind of done this pretty uh, kind of subtle effect so I think I want to go back to my brown Try mixing this into my brown. I don't want to get too dark.
So this is, you know, the underside of the lip is the darkest, like, of the top lip, the darkest part. white with my brown. So that's going to be getting the majority of the highlight. The bottom lip. Take a bit more white. I just mix it to the side. So that's the color I had on my brush. I added just white to it without even cleaning my brush. And I've just got kind of a lighter version of it. Do the same sort of thing with it. Take a bit of my white and my magenta. I mean, I, I could continue tinkering on this for a while, really playing with the cheeks and darkening that area. I mean, I guess I, I could. I kind of really like it, this painting as it is. I th maybe I need to do just a little bit because underneath the neck. Oh, and in the hair. Yeah, okay. thought it was a little bit closer. <laughs> so let's take my white. Let's go into the, to do this brown. Maybe just put a few I'm just gonna actually just take white and warm yellow.
Okay. Then I'll go the opposite direction with my wormy yellow. Cheer kind of thing going on here. Kind of not too dissimilar to what we had there earlier. Okay. Oh, I guess there was a little bit in the up here in the hair. Take this color. I think these are like little shadows. I feel like I can walk away from this feeling happy.
<laughs> okay. So. We're going to do our wrap up here. We're going to take a look at the painting side by side. You tell me what you think. Um, before we, we do that, just as a quick reminder, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. This Saturday, there's going to be a feedback episode. If you're new to the channel, upload your artworks to the Facebook group. Join the Facebook group, upload your artwork to it, and we'll take a look on Saturday. I don't exactly sure when that episode will air, so again, that's why you hit the notification bell, so when it's live, you get to know when it's live. Um, as well, if you want to leave a donation, if you felt like you learned something and it was worth a dollar, you can leave a donation via PayPal. You can use a super chat here in the YouTube, uh, in, within YouTube. If you see a little dollar sign next to where you can comment, that's how you can use, you can donate directly through YouTube. And if you want to contact me to, to just say hello or you want to do transfer you can also contact me through my email via the Facebook or with my emails on my website right okay so let's take a look side by side how they turned out unsurprisingly my colors are a little bit more vibrant and brighter than than the painting the original uh, but that's just sort of my own style of painting, and it, it does have a little bit to do with the palette that we use, which is, you know, it, we're using more intense colors. But I, I think it turned out pretty well. I guess I could have darkened down in here a little bit more, uh, a little bit darker down in there. even on his cheek that could get darker I mean there's little uh, there's always little bits that we could do we could just go on forever and ever and ever right even on the top of his ear here probably could have taken that same color in fact I will just take a bit of that same color uh, yeah okay that's all I'm gonna do <laughs> and uh, He does look like he's a little bit squished down. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, but yeah, I feel pretty good about that. I, I, I'm very satisfied with the shirt in particular. I feel like we really got the, the, the Van Gogh look there, absolutely. We'll just zoom in for a moment. See how we did. Come on, let's go there. Yeah. Bonfire, I can live with that for sure. For sure. Okay. And maybe let's just take a look. You know, down here. Uh, let's take a look up at the hair. You know, my background certainly looks a little bit darker than in the original, but it is what it is. I think we can be pretty happy with this, right? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining me, um, for painting along with me. Lots of comments there of people getting ready for dinner. <laughs> Heidi says... Um, your painting looks really good, Michael. Not sure what his mother would think receiving this portrait. He never seems relaxed. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, he, what did she think of him? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure there, there was, there's probably some record of, of how she felt. Um, <laughs> that's, that cracks me up. But, you know, maybe like, like most mothers are are, are are very forgiving of their 
of their uh, children, sometimes to a fault, right? Uh, I think she would have been very happy. Right? And the fact that this is, you know, probably, I don't think she, I don't, I don't think she saw him before he died. Uh, so this would have been kind of her final image of him, which is kind of interesting to think of. Um, anyway, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you guys on Saturday, probably around 3 or 4 in the afternoon here on the West Coast. And we'll celebrate your achievements. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your night, and we will talk to you again very soon.